Um, so our first speaker today is Aisha Juman, um, and, and she is actually the mastermind behind this event. Um, she's a Yemeni American who lives in the Seattle area and is a public health specialist working as a consultant on health-related projects in Yemen. She regularly visits her home country. Uh, Juman worked at PATH, the Programs for Appropriate Technology in Health, directing an HPV vaccine project uh, between 2008 and 2010. And before that, she was at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, since 1995. Uh, and um, she, served, she served as a consultant to CDC following. Aisha is the president of the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, one of the sponsors of this event, which provides humanitarian aid in Yemen. Thank you, Amy. And thank you for all uh, for attending this. This is a very inspiring to see so many young people. Our future is in your hands. <laughs> So, um, and I hope and pray that it's better than what we did, uh, what our generation did. Louder. Okay, closer to the mic. I need to get this out so I can move. Okay, so I'm gonna start my presentation by showing you the picture of Sana'a. Sana'a is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That's where I grew up, that's where I went to school. So in terms of war in Yemen, I'll just give you a brief summary. Um, Arab Spring uprising occurred in January 2011. President of Yemen resigned in the November of the same year. A new president was elected in a one-man race for a two-year term in 2012. The Houthi, um, which is an insurgency, took Sana'a in September 2014 and put the president under house arrest. Negotiation for a unity government was taking place under the UN until March 2015, the UN envoy to Yemen announces Yemeni reached an agreement, and the next day, Saudi with nine, Arab, with nine Arab countries start airstrikes campaign to dislodge the Houthis. Yemen since has been under blockade, and airports and seaports are under Saudi control. No one gets in and out of Yemen without Saudi's permission. The blockade has created the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. There are about 20 million of 27 million people in Yemen who are in need of some humanitarian assistance today. Humanitarian, the situation in Yemen deteriorated significantly after the hostilities escalated in March 2015. All the information I'm presenting here are from UN reports or US media because I wanted to be as uh, non-biased as possible on this, on this issue. The UN reports do not say, do not criticize Saudi because they depend a lot on Saudi for their funding. So they will say escalated in March 2015 without mentioning that in March 2015 the Saudi started an air campaign on Yemen. More than 14 million people require immediate assistance to survive and famine is a cred credible risk for 7 million people in Yemen. Aid agencies warn against misconception that Saudi blockade in Yemen, of Yemen is lifted. Saudi from time to time will allow some things in and they will say the blockade is, has ended. But that is a misconception and this is save the children. So in terms of food imports, how has the blockade impacted the food imports? This is from January to March 2017 and the UN stopped producing reports like this because it can be used to show the devastation in Yemen. I just want to show two things. One, the red line is the humanitarian assistance that gets into Yemen. And the dark line is what is commercial imports into Yemen. The idea that humanitarian assistance is gonna be enough to sustain a population in Yemen is a misconception. The humanitarian assistance in Yemen is less than 10% of what gets to Yemen. And without commercial imports, a lot of people in Yemen will die. This shows the food imports compared to what is needed in Yemen. Again, the darker, the darker bar is what's allowed in Yemen, and the uh, lighter one is what Yemen needs. And you can see it fluctuates from 20 to 48 percent, but we know also in the most recent years is less than 20 percent. 
so this is a New York Times said, Saudi tried to starve Yemen into submission. And by the way, starving a population as a tactic of war is a war crime. So the World Food Program uh, updated the information on Yemen of what's available in the country. So as of January 2018, there are sufficient cereals in Yemen to last only for 68 days. And there are rice sufficient for 102 days. At the same time, there is enough diesel for nine days and enough petrol for four days. Imagine a whole country knowing they only have four days of fuel. Al Hudaydah port is the most important port in Yemen because it has the capacity to receive large shipments. And it's also close to the center of where the population, the 80% of the population almost lives. So they, and the Saudis have been trying to, they have a blockade on it, but also they've been trying to have airstrikes and to attack it. And the international community had said no. President Obama said no twice to them. But now there is an effort again to bomb Hudaydah. The humanitarian community advocates for keeping the critically Al Hudaydah and all ports open to delivery of vital supplies. Yemen requires a monthly food import of this much. The humanitarian imports are only now 21% 20, of what Yemen needs. About 80% of the imports, including commercial and humanitarian aids, come through Al Hudaydah air, uh, port. Al Hudaydah port is the only port in Yemen that can receive that that much of the commodities into Yemen. And again, it's close proximity to where most of the people in need are. Uh, the Saudis said that they are going to be providing aid to Yemen, but they also started a very strong PR campaign. The Yemen PR war, Saudi Arabia employs UK and US firms to push multi-million dollar aid plan. The reason they want to do that is because they want to destroy the Hadeida port, they want to blockade the Hadeida port completely and shut it down, and then they want to bring food through ports that they control that are very small. But that also means that 80% of the population in Yemen will actually have nothing to eat. Impact of the Saudi siege. This is Alex Duwal and his book, Mass Starvation, The History and Future of Famine. These are actually direct quotes. Yemen is the greatest famine atrocity of our t lifetime. The Saudis are deliberately destroying the country's food producing infrastructure. The United States and the European countries have enough leverage to get the Saudis and the Emiratis to stop bombing agriculture, health and market infrastructure and open the ports. It's, it's a political created famine that will have to be solved by political created means. This is ICRC. It says Yemen border closure, closure shuts down water sewage system raising cholera risk. Yemen experienced the largest cholera uh, outbreak in our recent history. Over one million cases of cholera. This is unacceptable in this time. And the reason for that is that Saudi had bombed all the water sources and all those sewage sources and there wasn't enough fuel for people to be able to get clean water. We also have a diphtheria outbreak. Today there are over 1,000 diphtheria cases and 66 deaths. Diphtheria has not been in Yemen since the 1980s. And this is, these are all direct results of the um, blockade. Hidden cost of war. In Yemen, thousands could die of kidney failures. I get daily pleas from kidney centers in Yemen for uh, resources to get them the medication they need. They don't have anything in the country anymore. But again, that's a result of the blockade. Cancer patients in Yemen face slow death as treatment options diminish because, again, there is no medication for cancer cases. This is Jan England, who is the head of the Norwegian uh, Relief um, Organization. He went to Yemen in May, and he said, an aid worker told me, fear among Yemenis is so great that mothers grab their managed children from hospital beds on hearing warplanes. Why would a mother be afraid th when a child is in a hospital? Because the Saudis have uh, destroyed half of the health centers in Yemen. Four MSF hospitals were hit by Saudi airstrikes repeatedly, not once by mistake. They will come back and hit the rescuers. You remember when the U.S. hit an MSF hospital in um, Afghanistan, the outrage and the investigation? None of these were investigated in Yemen. 
impact of war and siege on children in Yemen. UNICEF described airstrike by Saudi-led coalition as indiscriminate and disproportionate. UNICEF representative in Yemen, Julian Harris, said over 900 children killed and 1,000 300 wounded just alone in 2015. Airstrikes account for 61% of deaths and injuries. Deaths of 10,000 children, less than five, from preventable diseases to the collapse of the country's health system in 2015. In Yemen, a child dies every 10 minutes from preventable causes. It's not the bombs that's killing people. The, they are killing people, but it's mostly the blockade, the lack of medicine, the lack of clean water. You are naming and shaming armies that kill and maim children on the battlefield. The Saudi, uh, Saudi was listed twice, but they managed to get themselves out because the Saudi pressure UN to remove them from list of children's rights violation with the help of the US and the UK. US role in Yemen. Yes, Saudi Arabia seal weapons deal worth nearly 110 billion immediately and 350 billion over 10 years. Why should we be concerned? Because the Lehi law says if we provide weapons to a country that violates international law, then we are responsible. Stop the unconstitutional war in Yemen. There, this is an unconstitutional war. The US government provides fuel to Saudi jets that fly over Yemen. Without the refueling mid-air, the Saudi would stop the bombing today. Trump may be helping to create famine in Yemen. Congress could stop him. So what can we do as individuals? There are a lot of things we can do. We can reach out to our representatives in Washington and to the White House to express concern about the conflict in Yemen. We can ask that they stop supporting Saudi war in Yemen, pressure Saudi to end the blockade on Yemen, and use diplomacy for a political solution. There are a lot of petitions out there. Please find them and sign them, because it's really very sad when I see the signatures that come are petitions for Yemen with hundreds of people signing. A lot of it is because not many people know what's happening in Yemen, and that is because the Saudis have employed a lot of PR firms that are working for them. Donate to any organization that's working in Yemen, UNICEF, Oxfam, everybody who's working in Yemen, they are out care. There's also a Yemen Relief and Construction Foundation that I established because of the great needs in Yemen. Please visit our website and our Facebook and donate if you would like to do that. Thank you. Is this the slide you want to leave up? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Aisha. That's helped set the stage for what's happening in Yemen, and uh, we're now going to hear from people working on the policy situation. Kate Gould is our next speaker. Uh, she is Legislative Director for Middle East Policy for the Friends Committee on National Legislation, a Quaker lobby in the public interest. Kate has spent nearly a decade as one of only a handful of registered lobbyists in Washington, D.C., working to advance human rights objectives and support diplomatic solutions in U.S. policy towards the Middle East. Kate's analysis has been cited by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other national outlets. Kate is a graduate of Fairhaven College and Huxley College of the Environment at Western Washington University. So welcome home. Imagine that the entire population of Washington State, 7.3 million people are on the brink of starvation. With the port city of Seattle under a naval and aerial blockade, leaving it unable to receive and distribute countless tons of food and aid. Just that sit waiting offshore. This nightmare scenario is akin to the obscene reality occurring in the Middle East poorest country, Yemen, at the hands of the region's richest, Saudi Arabia, with unyielding United States military support that Congress has not authorized and therefore it's unconstitutional. 
That's the opening paragraph of the New York Times op-ed published last October by a bipartisan group of members of Congress. As Aisha mentioned, uh, those numbers have to be updated now, very sadly. So now we're talking about 8.4 million people who are on the verge of starving to death. So I know we're throwing out a lot of numbers at you, but just to try to imagine, that's the entire population of Washington State, plus the population of, of Portland, Oregon, within the city limits, plus the population of Vancouver, Canada, that are one step away from starving to death. And it's happening in large part because our government is doing this, is aiding and abetting Saudi war crimes as the Saudi-led coalition um, bombs and blockades Yemen. So our government is actively facilitating the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. And our taxpayer dollars are, are funding it. So of course, the, uh, you know, that's the bad news. Um, the good news is, is that there's nowhere else on earth where the U.S. has more leverage to use to save more lives and to stop more people from starving to death. The catastrophic war that's led by the Saudis, um, it, it's, you know, it's led by the Saudis and the UAE, but there's U.S. support there at every stage. So uh, it's F-15 fighter jets that are made by Boeing, you know, the largest employer in Washington state. Um, and those F-15s are bombing or dropping bombs, you know, that were made by the U.S. Uh, and those bombs are being dropped on markets and weddings and um, funeral halls and uh, water treatment facilities that are creating the kind of humanitarian crisis that Aisha talked about. And when those bomber jets run out of fuel, they don't even have to go down to the ground. They don't have to, um, ground to get to the ground level to get refueled. Instead, they can just keep hovering in the sky and then these giant air tankers, um, these giant uh, American tankers will then meet the Saudis and refuel them, pump them with more fuel so that they can just take a quick break from bombing Yemen um, and go up, get refueled, and then continue the carpet bombing of Yemen. And so when those US-fueled, US-made bombers drop US-made bombs on civilians or civilian targets, like the Doctors Without Borders hospitals um, that Aisha was talking about, four hospitals within a single year that were bombed, then, it's, then we, we've seen over and over again that US diplomats have shielded Saudi Arabia from being held accountable at the United Nations, from being held accountable on the world stage. But right now, we have the best chance we've had throughout the entire course of this war. It's gone on for nearly three years. It'll be three years in March. And we have the best chance we've had so far to actually end it. So what makes this moment a particular tipping point? Well, I would say the most important factor in that is that we've seen this incredible tide of grassroots mobilization around this issue. Um, that even though there's been a near media blackout on this, that uh, where I, you know, arguably this is one of the most important stories for Americans to hear about, it should be on the front page um, all the time, that uh, we haven't seen that happening. We, what we have seen though uh, recently is that so many more people have been getting engaged um, in talking to Congress and really putting this issue at the forefront of the policy agenda. Uh, we, we, so we have people, of course, um, like Aisha, who've been doing this for so long, every step along the way, and working day and night to get out the word. And then we have people who've never heard, may, may have, you know, never heard much about Yemen before, um, but are learning about it and getting engaged and realizing that this is so crucial on, to um, all war and peace issues. We also have champions in Congress, um, and you guys are very lucky to uh, be in Seattle where you have two members, members of Congress, one here tonight, um, and also Congressman Smith, and also Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who've really pushed this issue forward in DC. Um, and we've seen some exciting developments about that, uh, that have sent the message that it's time that the US um, rein in this kind of uh, blank check for Saudi Arabia, and, and really um, make sure that there's some accountability here uh, and that the U.S. stop perpetuating mass hunger. 
So um, we've seen one example of how Congress has really made a difference and, and changed the story, and, and of course how the grassroots have made the difference that have, have made um, the national discourse change around this issue is around the legislation, um, the number of it is HCON Res 81. So that legislation was introduced by Congressman Ro Khanna. Uh, for, he's a Democrat from California, and he introduced it with a congressman from Kentucky, Tom Massey. They introduced this bipartisan legislation that would end US military involvement in the Saudi-led war in Yemen. Um, so they, and that was the, uh, the subject of that op-ed um, that I mentioned earlier. This legislation invokes the 1973 law called the War Powers Resolution. And that, um, because it invokes that law, um, which ensures that Congress actually, you know, it has to authorize any kind of US military involvement um, that's long term, that it is required to have a vote on the floor. It was required to have a vote um, on the floor of the House. But we've seen over and over again that, unfortunately, um, the Republican House leadership have often prevented Congress from being able to vote on war and peace issues, and this was another example of that. So even though this legislation um, required by law that they get a vote, then uh, that was th then the Republican House leadership went to such extreme measures that as they actually uh, violated the War Powers Resolution to stop that kind of um, debate and vote. But instead of having a vote on that legislation, uh, which now has 50 co-sponsors, then the House instead passed a non-binding um, compromise resolution. They worked it through negotiations to develop this language, and uh, that was passed on the crisis. Um, now, the good part about that uh, piece, that, that agreement was that there was, it, it did um, provide a chance for the House to debate for the first time of this three year war the U.S. role in the war. Now, unfortunately, though, the legislation itself, the language of the legislation, was very problematic. Um, and I wanted to read, actually, a, um, just a sentence from Congressman Smith's powerful statement about why he opposed the resolution, writing, um, I believe the resolution did not go far enough to articulate Saudi Arabia's role in creating and perpetuating the ongoing humanitarian crisis. Instead, the resolution placed a disproportionate level of blame on Iran. Iran remains a detriment to peace and stability in Yemen. However, Saudi Arabia should also be held accountable for their actions. So that is, um, I would say, right on the mark in terms of, uh, and, and one of the strongest statements that came out of this, this first debate that the House ever had um, on the U.S. role in the, in the war. Now, uh, while we didn't get a vote, what we, what we wanted, you know, the vote on that legislation, um, the good news is, is that that legislation helped lay the foundation for what is coming next. So we have two really exciting initiatives coming up where all of you can really make a difference in pushing uh, this, these, both of these initiatives forward to help end the war. So the first initiative is that, um, and I should say that you all in this room are some of the first people to hear about this, uh, because this is, this is very much late breaking news, that in response to grassroots demands from both conservatives and progressives, we are expecting that a bipartisan group of senators are going to soon um, introduce legislation similar to HCON Res 81 as soon as next week which would force a vote to end unauthorized U.S. participation in a war led by Saudi Arabia against Yemen's Houthi rebels. Unfortunately, we can't get into uh, more details about that legislation, but, um, but if you would like to hear about it and hear about how you can get involved, then please sign up for our list. Um, your emails will only be going to uh, FCNL, Win Without War, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, um, and we can update you about when that legislation is out. So I'm just gonna pass this around and, and hope you all will We'll sign on, um, and we can we can give you some really just very quick actions that you can take, like making a quick phone call uh, to w once the legislation is out to Senators um, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell, and also I'm sure some of you are from other states, um, and because you, you can call your home state senators and to please spread the word to people across the country, your family and friends. We need everybody to get on board on this. So that's the. Um, 
first legislation, and I should say, and, and what's, what's really exciting about that too is that in the Senate, there's not the same kind of rules that the House has where it's so easy for leadership to block this kind of vote, um, that it, each individual senator has more power to force a vote. So we expect that there will be a vote finally uh, next month on ending US military involvement in the war. The second big uh, upcoming initiative on Yemen in Congress is um, in the House. And so Congressman Ro Khanna has recently announced that he will soon be introducing legislation that would not only end US military involvement in the war, um, but also stop any kind of transfer of, um, of bombs to Saudi Arabia until and the other countries that are involved in this war uh, until the blockade is lifted and until the war is over, until those two things happen. So um, this legislation would effectively end U.S. complicity, U.S. military involvement altogether uh, in this devastating war. So we will also, um, also by signing up with the, to the list going around, then you can get more information about that when the bill actually comes out, and we'll let you know about key opportunities to make a difference um, and move the ball forward on that. Can I just get a show of hands? How many of you have ever um, called your congressional office or emailed about any issue? Okay, looks like most of the room. That's fabulous to see, okay. How many of you have done so about Yemen? Just curious, a little, okay, lots of people, great. <laughs> um, excellent, how many of you have visited either your uh, members of Congress, met with them, or met with their staff? How many of you um, have been in a room with a member of Congress? Okay, all of you should raise your hands. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Just had to put that in. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, um, so and, and how many of you will before, so, you know, March 25th marks the 30th anniversary of this war, uh, so it's coming up in a few weeks. How many of you will commit that before March 25th, you will call or email Congress or both about Yemen, about ending, U.S. military involvement in this war. All right, wonderful to see, great. Okay, well, uh, remember that because um I hope, because I'll be calling you on it. I, I will have some of your phone numbers and emails addresses. <laughs> um, it, it, but see, it's so important, and it's really, um, you know, this is where, again, you know, where the U.S. has so much leverage, and so as as citizen advocates, where we have so much power to make a difference. And if all of you who raise their ha raise your hands actually do go ahead and call and email, um, then that will certainly make a difference. Um, there is an incredible amount of power in this room to stop millions of people from starving to death. So let's make sure to use it and to end the Hunger Games in Yemen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. And what was that piece of legislation called again? H. Conrez? 81. 81. Can we remember that number? Maybe we'll try it again at the end. It's not so I'll, I'll mention it. No, okay, good. All right. Um, and just so you know, we are making a professional recording of this event today. So um, there will be a video clip of all the proceedings today that will be up on the Facebook page for this event, as well as on the HAI website and perhaps other places. So look for that if you want to share it with your friends and neighbors and relatives. Okay, so next we are thrilled to invite Adam Smith to the stage. He was uh, raised in SeaTac, Washington, probably before it was named SeaTac, Washington. Correct. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where he attended public schools, and he graduated from the University of Washington School of Law in 1990 and served as a Seattle City prosecutor in the early 1990s. He was elected to the Washington State Senate at the age of 25. Just remember that, all of you. Uh, Congressman Smith serves as the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee and is the co-founder of the Congressional Caucus for Effective Foreign Assistance which works to reform American foreign assistance to more effectively address global poverty. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, it is uh, good to be back at the University of Washington. I certainly uh, 
Well, I didn't enjoy my time here as a law student. <laughs> Though I, I don't blame the school. And uh, for all those, you, you don't remember, the law school actually used to be in a different location just down the street in a rather ugly building. The brand new law school, all of us who graduated before they built that are really jealous of the uh, quality of the law school. Um, but I do have very, very fond memories of working with the uh, Jackson School here um, and teaching the task force class for five or six years. Uh, I know we saw it, uh, who runs that uh, uh, department is here, and I really appreciate that experience. It was great working with the students on a wide variety of topics, uh, including some which tangentially touch on the issue that we're talking about today. Um, and I think there is a very simple, straightforward step that was described by the previous speakers. Congress can assert its role to cut off our support for Saudi Arabia and what they're doing in Yemen. And what would happen, just a little more background, uh, Representative Khanna did introduce that privilege resolution, which was very strong uh, on cutting that off. But then there was sort of a negotiation, and they did sort of a, a second degree offering, um, which Representative Khanna agreed to and then kind of regretted agreeing to. And we wound up in voting something that was really toothless and didn't do anything. So that doesn't mean that we can't bring it back um, in a separate form, as was described, and the Senate can bring it back. And, you know, there's no way to add any um, details to what was said. I've, I've been to Yemen once. This was in 2009, so this is before some of this. But even back then, um, it is a struggling country in a huge humanitarian crisis that we ought to pay attention to and ought to try to do something about. Uh, and the statistics and facts that were shown in the slides, I. You know, I can't say it any better than that. Um, it is a catastrophe and a humanitarian crisis. Um, and it's saying something that you can say that Yemen is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world right now, given all of the other places in the world that have wars and struggles. Um, it is a very, very difficult situation that we ought to try to step up uh, and help with. And step one is cutting off uh, what Saudi Arabia is doing to help. I do, just quickly before we get to other speaker and questions, want to offer a little bit of context, because I think it's going to be helpful for you in terms of lobbying Congress to understand. I mean, if you, if you were to listen to this, it's like, Saudi Arabia just basically a bunch of bastards just doing this for, you know, for the sake of killing people. You know, what's the background here? What's, what's the reason for all of this? And there are a couple of complicating factors in terms of moving forward on the policy. One is it's not 100% accurate to say that the war in Yemen has been going on since 2015. Um, it's been going on a lot longer than that. Um, there are deep divisions within Yemen. They've had a series of wars over the years uh, between different tribal factions. The Houthis have been one of the main ones. Not that long ago, there were actually two Yemens um, because of the differences of opinion. And, and that war was fulminating. And it's going to be a challenge, no matter what Saudi Arabia does, to bring them back together and get into a coalition government. I mean, during most of this, you had a battle between the current sitting president uh, and the former president, um, who ironically, um, this was um, President Saleh, um, who had spent a fair amount of time as his time as president fighting the Houthis. Um, once thrown out of power, he then joined them in an alliance going up against President Hati, Hati who was um, in charge of the country at the time. Um, so there is a lot going on that is going to take an enormous amount of work internationally as well as locally to bring peace and stability in some sort of government um, that can bring that peace and stability to Yemen, uh, regardless of what we do with Saudi Arabia. Um, so that's number one. We have to work on it. It's regrettably somewhat similar to Somalia uh, in the terms of the way it has fractured and lost any sort of sense of control. Um, the second thing um, that is important, and the reason that it complicates in terms of what we're doing with Saudi Arabia, is the reason that we fund and support Saudi Arabia, well, there are a number of them, but two stand out. Number one, of course, is because of our long time historical relationship on needing their oil. Um, and that is not to be understated. But second is because there is a, and it's, believe me, it is, it is a mixed bag, but Saudi Arabia has from time to time helped us as we fight against groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, they have also, from time to time, had a number of their citizens who have funded um, the very groups that form ISIS and Al-Qaeda, something that the new leader of Saudi Arabia is trying to change. Um, they're trying to modernize their country, uh, but they have huge challenges. So just taking Yemen, well, it's two pieces of it. There's Yemen, and then there's the whole Iraq-Syria thing. So why we sell, I mean, you know, 
planes and bombs and all the stuff to Saudi Arabia, in part is because Saudi Arabia and the UAE have been leaders in the coalition that has been fighting back against that, and in two places. There's a good chunk of Yemen uh, that is ungovernable, and a good portion of that uh, has been taken over by a faction of Al-Qaeda, the AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And this is where Anwar al-Awlaki was operating out of. Um, and on two occasions, Newley was able to carry off successful terrorist attacks against the US. Um, we all remember the underwear bomber in 2008, um, who had a bomb on the plane going into Detroit, which fortunately did not detonate. That was started out of a plot in Yemen led by Awlaki. Uh, and then there was the plot, I think it was in 2010, where they placed bombs on uh, FedEx and UPS planes that were intended to come into the US uh, that we also cut off. They're, they're still operating. And our initial presence in Yemen was a relatively small group of special operations forces who were working with the Saleh government to try to contain the Al-Qaeda element in Yemen. We could not operate in there without the permission um, of the government, um, at least not easily. So we had a relationship with Saleh based on that. And there was a whole lot of bad stuff going on with the Saleh government at the time. Um, but we were fairly focused on stopping that terrorist threat that was coming out of Yemen. And it's still there. Um, it's been substantially reduced, um, primarily because of the pressure campaign that we have led, sometimes with cooperation from the Yemeni government, uh, sometimes not. Second thing is, while we were dealing with ISIS and the chunk of territory that they had grabbed in Iraq and Syria, a lot of those refueling missions and a lot of those bombers that were given to Saudi Arabia were used to bomb ISIS positions in Syria and Iraq. Um, there's a big problem with this, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but as a general rule, I don't want to mislead you. I am concerned about Al-Qaeda and ISIS and about their ability to plot and carry out attacks against the US. And I think one, though certainly not our only national security objective, should be to stop them from doing that. So you know, Saudi Arabia has been a partner in that. Now, the problem with all this, of course, is that where is the congressional authorization for this war? And that's a subject, actually, it was one of the subjects that I taught. Um, you know, it's a discussion of, you know, how, how do we handle Al-Qaeda and these different groups after 2001? And basically, the way we've handled it is whether it was President Bush, President Obama, or now, God help us, President Trump, um, it is the president gets to do what he wants to do. And they bootstrap it back to an authorization in 2001, a whole bunch of other things. Our military is being operated by the commander in chief without the congressional oversight that I believe it should have. It has an unlimited aperture um, to strike all across the world, certainly within the Middle East, but they've struck in other places as well. So in addition to Representative Khanna's uh, legislation restricting our support for Saudi Arabia's operations in Yemen, we need a new op authorization for the use of military force that limits and restricts that. Because to put it bluntly, I, I do not trust this president. He doesn't know anything of what we're talking about here. Um, and he sort of turns over responsibility to the military. And I'm deeply concerned that we've had a tripling in civilian casualties since he's become president, and not um, coincidentally, a tripling in the number of bombing attacks that have been carried out uh, in the name of this broader war against ISIS and Al Qaeda. And indiscriminate bombing is not the way to solve this problem. Um, like I said, I'm not afraid to confront these people, but it also creates more enemies, it undermines our legitimacy in the world, uh, and it kills innocent people, which we should not be doing in the name of any war. And there's not sufficient congressional oversight over that, to be sure, and we need to do that. Um, so that, that is the, the complicating factor. The role of Iran in Yemen is somewhat debatable. The, well, the Houthis started before Iran was supporting them. Um, it's a Shia Sunni thing, as much of the Middle East is these days. Um, and Iran now, however, is clearly backing the Houthis in a variety of different ways. And it's a proxy for the broader war in the Middle East uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And if we're ever going to get to a situation where we have peace in the Middle East, we've got to figure out some way uh, to broker uh, peace between the Sunni and the Shia. Um, because you've got Saudi Arabia and the UAE and 
one side and Iran on the other, and they're fighting all over the place. It's not just Yemen, it's Iraq, it's Lebanon, it's Syria, um, and we have humanitarian crises that are not quite as large as Yemen, uh, but Syria and Iraq have enormous problems as a result of that conflict as well. So we've got to figure out a way to, to, to confront that. And, and Saudi Arabia is not been good in the way they've done this. You've seen what they've done with Yemen. They're also trying to cut off Qatar. Um, I know you're supposed to call it gutter, but I just, I can't do that. Um, so Qatar is, you know, are, important to the U.S., obviously, because we have a substantial air base there. But the problem Saudi Arabia has is Qatar is also trying to be friendly with Iran, which I consider to be reasonably intelligent. Um, you know, sandwiched between what two large powers, you'd like to figure out how to get along with both of them. Saudi Arabia is also attempting to blockade Qatar in order to sort of browbeat them into distancing themselves from Iran. So all of that swirls around a broader peace effort to bring some type of stability uh, to the humanitarian crisis that spreads throughout the Middle East. But as with all of these problems, I, I believe you can look at the big picture and get overwhelmed by it. Or you can do what, what these folks have done is look at a piece of it and say, OK, big picture notwithstanding, this is wrong. And, and, and we can solve it. We can begin to turn it in a different direction and actually put pressure on Saudi Arabia uh, to stop the actions that they're taking in Yemen. Uh, because the scorched earth approach that they have is it's not in their best interest and it's certainly not in the best interest of Yemen long term in terms of bringing any sort of stability to the region. I mean, since they've started this war, um, there have now been missiles that have been launched at Riyadh. Um, which wasn't happening before they started bombing Yemen. So they have you know, ratcheted up the possibility of violence in the region that they live in. So I think we ought to try and cut them off. And I will also finally say, any action on this is going to have to come from Congress. I, I don't think that President Trump is going to do anything to try to control Saudi Arabia. Uh, the president's foreign policy is a little bit hard to decipher at times. Um, but one thing you can bet on if you look at the history of the Trump business and you see the countries where he's done a lot of business in, he's going to be friendly to them. Um, and Saudi Arabia definitely falls into that category. So the notion that President Trump is going to put any sort of pressure on Saudi Arabia is one that I do not buy into. It is going to have to come from Congress. Uh, so the advice that you lobby your members of Congress, um, that you push for them to make this a front and center issue is what it's going to take um, to really get some changes made uh, and help at least with this first step of stopping what Saudi Arabia is doing, ending the humanitarian crisis. But I will also remind you that if you're committed to this issue, don't just take that first step. The second step is if we can stop what Saudi Arabia is doing, how do we arrive at some sort of peaceful arrangement between the multiple different factions that are fighting for control and fighting for power in Yemen? Uh, that will not be easy no matter what Saudi Arabia winds up doing. And I think the United States has an obligation to attempt to do to go all the way to bringing some measure of peace and stability to Yemen. So I thank you for the chance to be here, and I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Would you like to come up and change the website, Aisha? Maybe. Mo, I just want to say, somebody asked that I put the Yemen Relief Reconstruction website. I do have some pamphlets here and outside, so on, please take one, because I like the picture that we have there. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Uh, well, um, we next have another Kate, and I just want to note that both Kates, Kate Gould, who spoke first, and Kate Kaiser, who is speaking now, flew to Seattle specifically for this event today. Uh, and um, so we're really grateful to both of you for doing that work. Do you have one more? OK, he will be right back. You are welcome. Uh, so Kate Kaiser is the policy director at an organization called Win Without War, where she leads the organization's work to establish and advance a progressive foreign policy strategy for the United States. You have a hard job. Uh, Kate. 
Kate has nearly a decade of experience working on human rights and US policy towards the Middle East. Uh, previously, she was the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Yemen Peace Project. There's an organization you can look up, which seeks to establish a more constructive US foreign policy for Yemen. Kate is currently a master's degree candidate at Georgetown University's Democracy and Governance Program, and she holds a BA in Middle Eastern and North African Studies from UCLA. Thanks for being here. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a mouse. You don't have slides, nope. right? Nope. Okay. Just going to talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, I really appreciate all the different perspectives these speakers have given, particularly Congressman Smith. I'll thank him again when he gets back. Um, to, I would like to kind of talk about um, the work that I do in terms of democratizing foreign policy and how this bill that Kate mentioned that's coming up in the Senate um, in this next month and there will be a vote on is really an opportunity for the American people to finally have a voice in our foreign policy making process. Um, for decades at this point, U.S. foreign policy has been determined in closed backdoor rooms, um, typically by old white men um, who do not think about the people on the ground that their policies affect. Everything we do abroad will come back to us in some way. We've seen this in the endless years of global war against Al Qaeda and other extremist groups, and Yemen is no different. Our role in this war is very apparent to the Yemeni people. When you talk to Yemenis um, on the ground in Yemen, they ask, why is the US bombing us? It's not, why is Saudi Arabia bombing us? Sure, they ask that question too, but they know that it's US made planes, that it's US made bombs that are being dropped on their homes, on their schools, on their hospitals, and they don't understand what they did to the American people. So, over the past, I would say, year or so, we've started to see growing congressional attention um, and public attention to the situation in Yemen. But still, most Americans don't know that the US is intimately involved in a civil war in Yemen, let alone where it is on a map, which you know I've struggled with, too, before I studied in the Middle East. <laughs> um, and this attention has really been pivotal to changing this national dialogue about what we're doing in the region, um, and also what, what the hell is going on in Yemen. You know, when most, you talk about the situation in the Middle East, most people automatically go to Syria, and Sir the situation in Syria is dire. But this is even worse than Syria, if possible. And we are playing a direct role in creating this crisis and catastrophe for these people. So this war was started under Obama. Um, it was essentially de facto support for Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the rest of the Gulf countries um, in exchange for them to accept the Iran deal, which is a very important nuclear accord that has prevented Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. It was proposed as a two to three week intervention that would reinstall the legitimate transitional government of President Hadi. And then the Saudis and the UAE would leave, and the transition process in Yemen that began under the Arab Spring would continue. Now this intervention has been going on for almost three years. It's killed thousands and thousands of people, injured thousands more, put more than eight million people on the brink of famine, has let loose the largest, fastest growing cholera crisis ever documented in modern history, now there's a diphtheria outbreak, and the US is playing a role in this. In Syria, the US has very little leverage to really affect realities on the ground. In Yemen, we've been intimately involved there through our work to counter Al Qaeda since the early 2000s. And now, because of our de facto support, we are essentially creating a situation where we are in the process creating more enemies that we do not need while hurting children and innocent civilians who have done nothing to us except stand up for their rights in 2011 and call for democracy. So the fundamental question for the American people is why are we involved in this war? The US plays a U.S. officials continually say, this is not our war. We only provide refueling. We only provide logistical assistance to the Saudis in this war. It's not that big of a deal. But the reality is, is that they could not continue the tempo of airstrikes in the country without this vital military support from the U.S. 
And the second aspect of U.S. support is the political cover that we continue to provide in the international community that prevents any type of accountability from being had for these crimes that are committed. And that, don't get me wrong, as Congressman Smith mentioned, it's a very complicated situation. Any of the warring parties are not good people. Um, just because I'm saying, you know, we need to cut off support to Saudi Arabia doesn't mean I support the Houthis or what they have done to the population because they have also created some committed some pretty heinous crimes against civilians. Um, but it's really important to look at the fact that you have a voice in what the U.S. role is. And so that's what this bill in the Senate will do. It essentially says Congress has never voted or debated on giving you authorization for the use of force in this war. The War Powers Resolution of 1973 lays out what U.S. involvement in a war is. Most people just think it's deployment of troops on the ground, boots on the ground, that's a war. But this law actually defines it as any time U.S. military personnel are assisting or participating or coordinating the movement of foreign forces that are involved in active hostilities. So the U.S. is literally providing coordinates for airstrikes for the coalition. So they're determining where these planes are going and bombing. We're providing fuel to allow them to move to these places to bomb. And so just by a plain reading of the statute, it is clear that this is an unauthorized war, um, which is a debate that was had in the House. <laughs> so I, I think it's re also really important to view this upcoming war powers resolution in the Senate on Yemen as really the first opportunity that the American public will have to, and Congress will have to not only reassert its war making authority, um, but to start piercing open this debate about ending our endless global wars. The problems and challenges that we face in this world often do not have military solutions, but the de facto position of the US under George Bush under President Obama, under President Trump, has been to apply military pressure to these situations. And oftentimes, the second order effects just make the situations worse. And so this is an opportunity for us to voice our, to our senators that we want them to think about this differently, that we want them to actually stand up for the Constitution and rein in the executive power to make war. It's a pretty clear cut case when you can say, ask them, why are we sending bombs and giving fuel to a country that is, continues to bomb civilians? For three years, there's been a strategy by both administrations to provide better weaponry, to provide better targeting assistance, to make the airstrikes better, to kill less civilians. And we also have three years of evidence that that strategy hasn't worked. Despite this increased assistance, we continue to see a systematic pattern of airstrikes that target civilian areas and vital civilian infrastructure that have directly facilitated and created the humanitarian crisis. And don't take my word for it, this is, comes from the UN Security Council panel of experts on Yemen. They vociferously state and document airstrikes that are US supported that are potential war crimes. And so no matter where you are on the political spectrum, just coming at this from a humanity perspective, we want to be asking ourselves, why, why are we actively supporting such a brutal war? I mean, officials that I've heard in the Pentagon have said, this is, this is really a fourth or fifth century war being waged with modern technology. Why are we doing that? So, um, <laughs> I want to finish with how actually this bill could push for peace, as you mentioned. Um, it's actually, there's a clear kind of theory of change and we've seen this work in other contexts. So over the last year, um, Senator Todd Young, who's a Republican actually, very hawkish from Indiana, has been hammering home um, the humanitarian situation in Yemen, calling on Saudi Arabia, calling on the Trump administration to take action, to do something. Um, they've been blocking the delivery of our aid, they've been blocking the delivery of UN um, humanitarian assistance, and so this opposition reached a favor pitch. He's done letters, he's done legislation, um, he's done hearings. We had a vote on sending more bombs to Saudi Arabia where he and some other Republicans joined to block the sale because of the humanitarian situation. And when Saudi Arabia implemented this full blockade last November in response to a Houthi ballistic missile strike, 
to essentially collectively punish the population and try to starve Yemen into submission. Um, he was so outspoken and used his leverage with the administration to push them to actually take action. He threatened to invoke a law to force a vote on the floor to end assistance. It was a different law, there's multiple ways to do this, so it would be more opportunities. Um, but essentially, what happened was that was why the president spoke out and called on Saudi Arabia to end its blockade of Yemen and then eventually called for a ceasefire. And what happened is that Saudi Arabia, the UAE, these Gulf countries are very sensitive to public criticism. Like I was saying before, they rely on the US for political cover. And so if there's any like daylight in the relationship and US verbal support for the coalition's actions, they do something in reaction to that. So while it wasn't perfect, that advocacy by the administration that was pushed by Congress resulted in them temporarily opening the port of Hodeidah, which is Yemen's most vital port, as well as announcing um, new pledges of humanitarian aid and the like. But if the US actually wanted to affect the situation, Trump could have cut off the military support. He didn't. And so this is the opportunity with this vote that will come up in March to actually have Congress send the signal that enough is enough, that Congress will not stand by while we continue this brutal unauthorized war, and that if you get involved, the American people won't stand by and let these atrocities happen in our name. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Okay, be thinking of your questions while I rethink the sponsors of this event. Uh, the Advo Advocacy Committee at Health Alliance International, the Global Health Resource Center in the Department of Global Health, the Jackson School of International Studies, uh, the uh, Yemen Relief and um, this is in very small letters, Reconstruction Foundation and Roots of Conflict. So thanks again to our sponsors for doing that and thanks to um, all of you for traveling here today. Um, the two Kates and the Congressman um, made extraordinary efforts to be here. So um, one more announcement I will make is that in spring quarter, I teach a class called War and Health in the School of Public Health, um, open to both graduate and undergraduate students for those who are interested in taking that. Uh, I'm now gonna go over and get a microphone and start moving around to people who are raising their hands. And, um, or maybe somebody else could do that. Marianne, you, you be the... Uh, chooser of the questioners. So there are some hands up. Um, we're gonna do this kind of organically by passing the mic around. Marianne's just gonna choose who to uh, invite. And please tell us your name. Wait, can we hear that? Another person to thank is Mike McCormick, who is recording all this and will really appreciate it if we can hear the uh, questions. Okay. My name is Linda Eckert and I'm an OBGYN faculty at Harborview in the School of Medicine and also in Global Health. I wondered if you could educate us just a little bit more about the PR efforts and the money that the Saudis are pouring into this. I can, but you go ahead first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, as well as other Gulf countries, um, employ lobbying firms. There we go. Um, in Washington DC to make sure that their interests are heard. So in, I believe 2017, um, the number of PR and lobbyist firms that Saudi Arabia hired was around, I believe 28. Um, and then the UAE I believe has more than that. Um, and these are very, very slick K Street lobbying firms. They have typically employ former members of Congress, um, former administration officials. So they have a lot of access that groups like Kate and mine um, don't necessarily have. Well, we work to get it, 
Um, but it's a lot harder because we're not, you know, throwing money around, throwing fancy parties, getting people um, kind of in private rooms, have those types of conversations. And so it's, it's a really big um, challenge because it's not only that we have to educate members of Congress and the public about what's going on in Yemen, all the, these different dynamics that are going on, but we also then have to combat this massive propaganda machine that essentially has DC beholden, especially on foreign policy, um, and in Yemen in particular. I, I think that's a pretty good explanation. Could you and pass the mic so we can actually, get I this? Think, can you hear me? Oh, great. Okay. No. Hmm. This thing, is this thing not working? I guess I got to hold it up closer. Okay. Um, no, I think that's, that's a pretty good, good description of, of the way it works. And it's one of the shocking things that I found about when I went to Washington, D.C. versus in Olympia. Um, in Olympia, most companies, they have a handful of lobbyists who meet with everybody. In Washington, D.C., there's 535 members of Congress. What they have is they have law firms that specialize in certain members. Um, so you will have a lobbyist who's paid an enormous amount of money to lobby, in many cases, one member of Congress, someone who you know used to be on Paul Ryan's staff. So you know, this is a person who can get to Paul Ryan. And Saudi Arabia and UAE and all these folks, they, they got a lot of money. So they hire... Gosh, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was 50 different firms. And each one of those firms has, you know, their pitch is we have reached to this number of members. Um, we have a connection to this, to this member. And, and they're very effective about it. And I've, I've met with the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia on a number of occasions. Um, you know, I also meet regularly. I miss you when you were uh, back in DC, but I met with Jonathan Brown with, with Quakers. And so I meet with anybody. You, you don't have to give me money to meet with me. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's not just, it's not just about money. It, it, it's, it's, it's about access. Well, you know, if John, who used to be on my staff, calls up and says, hey, would you take a meeting? Um, you're more likely to take it because of the personal relationship. And believe me, there are very few groups out there that are better at that uh, than Saudi Arabia. I mean, they've been lobbying us for decades and have relationships upon relationships upon relationships, uh, and they make their pitch. And when I, I met with the foreign minister, they wanted to go over their, their targeting methodology. Um, I actually passed on that because, you know, the results are on the ground. You can show me a chart that says, you know, we only do this, we only do that. But, you know, I read the, the article about the, the funeral that they bombed, which if anything set back the peace process in Yemen further, I can't imagine it, that the key people who were at that moment trying to negotiate amongst these various factions that I've described all went to this one funeral and Saudi Arabia bombed it. And there is no evidence whatsoever that it was an accident. Um, they were targeting somebody in there, but there was a whole heck of a lot of other people that they took out. But they do come around, and as you said, they've tried to make the case in the last couple of years that they're trying to you know, change it and target it more and reduce the blockade, uh, but the facts on the ground tell a different story. But they are constantly out there lobbying, and not just members of Congress. Um, you know, the, Wherever public opinion is, they try to spread their message. All right. You know, just for the fun of it, why don't we hear three different questions and then we'll have a conglomerate answer. It's just, I want to hear more from our audience. So there's a guy right behind you. Why don't you just, for convenience sake, he's had his hand up a while. Hi there, my name is Garrett Moore. I'm an independent activist here in Seattle. I want to say a big thanks to Representative Smith. You, you're a champion for human rights all around the world. Um, so my question is, um, and while I definitely want to encourage and, and fully support the pulling military support from Saudi in the Yemen campaign, I want to ask, how does the United States government do that intelligently to ensure that Sa Saudis don't completely disengage and go seek military assistance from other powerful states that will um, allow even worse human rights abuses to take place with their weapons all right so that was a good question I, I don't know if this is possible given the seating here but we might get through we might get you can go ahead you do that might get through more people if you could have them come over and line up I mean, yeah, when I do my do town that? hall meetings they will typically line up behind the mic you can give the mic to somebody new now I'm but find Mary it's, it's hard to force to your way stairs. past everybody but it's a good thing we have this smart panel to help us get this organized all right Hi, my name is uh, Charles Gracie. I'm from Shoreline. Uh, I have, a, I think, an unorthodox question. Um, hopefully the, the idea doesn't get lost. Um, 
In addressing Yemen and U.S. Uh, approach to dealing with the crisis there, I think it does require some fresh eyes uh, to our foreign policy thinking. I, I think that graphic you have there is very relevant. Um, I think the problem is that the United States, a lot of our policymakers, are stuck in this mentality of system of alliances, of geopolitical alliances that really are rooted in the Cold War. Um, and I bring that up because aside from Congress, if the UN Security Council was functional, perhaps that would be another avenue. Um, however, there's the problem where the US and the UK don't seem to get along or s seem to think the same way as the Russians and the Chinese. Um, with that said, Don't, if you don't mind, um, can we take those, those two questions actually have a link. If we could take those two before we get to a third, that, that would be helpful. And because and I, I, I think there, there's definitely, I completely agree with what you've just said and not getting into my long-winded theory of, you know, foreign policy, but in short, moving from a, the, the bipolar world that we had, um, in the Cold War, and then briefly we had a unipolar world uh, where the U.S. was really dominant. Now we have a multipolar world. And the only way I think that we're going to move forward in a peaceful way is if we take the major players in the world, and they're not hard to figure out, certainly the European Union, Russia, China, India, Brazil, um, there are rising powers all over the world, and if we can get those countries to work together towards a shared goal of greater peace and stability. That's the only way we're going to get there, in large part because of the question that the gentleman before you asked. OK, so we cut off Saudi Arabia. Look, there are already a ton of countries in the Middle East um, that are reaching out and trying to do business with Russia and China. And I don't have an answer for what I'm going to say next. But the major challenge is that Russia and China do not seem to care that much about human rights. I mean, we're all very harsh on the U.S., but at least we have the Leahy Amendment. You know, at least we have debates in this country about should we be backing this country because of human rights. Russia and China, a lot of times, will try to get business with some of these other countries by saying, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be like the Americans. We're not gonna bust your chops about what your government is doing. You run your government however you wanna run your government, we'll do business with you. And in part, that's because both Russia and China have authoritarian governments. Um, and, and so that's a challenge to what you're saying. How, how do we work with these two countries? I mean, look, if it wasn't for Russia, I don't think Assad would still be in charge of Syria. Um, you know, Russia made that decision to go in there and back him. Now, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. I just want to be honest about the challenge of how we, we work with them to get them to Okay, um, we're, we're not, not on the same page then. Um, so, um, but big picture, we need to figure out how to get along with the other powers in the world to hopefully work together to bring greater peace and stability to the world. I do agree with that. All right, do we have any working microphones yet? So just really quick, um, yeah. in response to the first question, um, in addition to what the congressman talked about, I would just flag two things. Um, in the 1960s, under JFK, Saudi Arabia came to JFK because they were mounting a similar intervention into Yemen. Um, and they came and they said, President Kennedy, Please come and assist us in our war in Yemen. Please send troops, we need your support. President Kennedy said, we will support you, we will defend you because you are our ally, but this is not our war, we are not getting involved. And so the way to cut off assistance is to have this frank conversation with Saudi Arabia. This war is no longer in their interest. It, there's estimates that it costs $66 million a day for them to conduct this war. They are undergoing massive economic and austerity measures at home. And so 
just from an economic perspective, this war is no longer in their interest. So it's really up to the ally of the United States to have that frank conversation with its ally and say, we know you're concerned about Iran. We know you're concerned about your border. We will help you secure it. But this war is doing nothing to help you. It's actually exacerbating that problem. But the problem is, is that President Trump will not have that conversation on his own. He needs to be pushed. And so this bill in the Senate, as well as the one in the House, is all about sending that political message and giving the administration the leverage to have that conversation. And then the final point I will make is that that threat is made by Gulf countries on a regular basis when they're criticized for human rights abuses, when they misuse US sold weapons um, and other assistance. And I would just note that um, the US sells weapon systems, we don't just sell parts. And so we have built these Gulf countries militaries in Saudi Arabia from scratch. And so for them to actually go to Russia to buy new weapons, they would have to really start from scratch because there's a bunch of interoperability issues with the hardware. And so it's actually not a really feasible threat <laughs> for them to follow through on. And so I think you know it's, it's about, again, having that dialogue to scale back the threats to get past that, to really talk about what their interests and how the alliance can help that. Okay, thank you. Uh, why don't we have our next questioner come to the microphone here since we seem to have a massive hardware failure. <laughs> Hi, um, <clears throat> my name is Jim Loeb and I, I direct a blog that centers on U.S. policy in the Middle East. Though I rarely write for it, I get other people to do so. Um, <laughs> what I wanted, uh, I wanted to ask a question of the congressman. In particular, um, you cited uh, the reasons for U.S. the primary reasons for U.S. support for Saudi Arabia, UAE, and so on are relate to their energy resources and our need for them, and the help that they offer with uh, with respect to Al Qaeda and other extremist groups, um, which is debatable. But what I wanted to know was um, what role do arms sales? and for that matter, even commercial sales of aircraft, among other things, play uh, in, in our support for Saudi Arabia and UAE, and for that matter, Qatar uh, in, um, as well. Um, and to what extent, for example, does this uh, spin machine uh, replicate itself in terms of lobbyists from US arms manufacturers? How important is that as a reason for U.S. support? Thank you. It's very important, and I apologize for ha having left it out. I mean, you know, America, companies of all kinds, I mean, forget, you know, weapons and, and arms manufacturers for the moment, you know, whatever the product is, uh, we want these countries to buy from American companies, and that that's a, a huge part of the relationships, and I don't understand all the, you know, interconnections of those relationships uh, in terms of what, what companies are strongest in, say, Saudi Arabia or the UAE, what products are sold the most there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, here locally, you know, we constantly have the battle between Boeing and Airbus, and this is even on the commercial side. And, you know, our relations, the foreign relations that we conduct with a country impact, you know, the, these are threats that these countries will throw at us. You know, if you chastise us for this, we'll buy Airbus um, or we'll buy somebody else's product. So, yes, uh, global capitalism and the desire to get these various countries to invest in American products, I am quite certain plays a role uh, in how much pressure we feel like we can put on these countries. It's part of, of the relationship and part of the negotiation without a doubt. Uh, my name is Jane Cutter and I'm with the Answer Coalition, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism here in Seattle. And first of all, I just want to thank the panelists. It's really great to be in a room where I'm not the person who knows the most about Yemen. So um, I do actually know kind of a lot about Yemen. I lived in Yemen and during most of much of 2001 and what's going on there is just devastating and it's very inspiring to see that a movement is coming together to bring this to Congress and so I'm very glad glad about that and I think that's something that we can all unite around which is stopping US aid to Saudi Arabia that's supporting this brutal war. Um, I also think that uh, um, you know 
we, I would like to ask the panelists, um, I mean, I, I hear people talking about uh, the need to make sure that whoever comes into power at the end of this, you know, because like you said, it's not going to just be ended by ending the Saudi war. There is, in fact, a multi-party civil war going on. It's very, com it is, as people have stated correctly, very complex, and I urge people to really learn about the history. Um, I would argue that we should support self-determination for the Yemeni people as opposed to attempting to impose something that the United States thinks is going to be in its best interest, but rather to let the Yemeni people determine for themselves what is in their best interest. And I'd like to ask the panelists what they think of that as being the guiding principle of any policy towards Yemen. Thank you. Okay, so that was a question about Yemeni self-determination. Let's have another question before we go to the panel. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, your name? My name is Makia. Uh, I would like to say something. My mom is from Yemen, and I have visited Yemen eight years ago, and my dad is from Saudi Arabia, so I'm aware of two cultures, and these are two countries of mine. I love them so much. Um, so my question is, to be first, like all the resources that I have seen here is from New York Times, from US resources. I, I have never seen like from Middle East or um, Jazeera resources, only it's about Western resources. So I would like to say something. Um, in 1980s, like we have in Saudi Arabia, we have a great history with Yemen because we believe Yemen are our brothers. We have a lot of people, Yemenis live in Saudi Arabia, more than two million Yemeni. And uh, six months ago, Saudi Arabia accepted 40,000 Saudi Yemeni to enter the country as innocent people. They looking for a place to be, uh, to live in a safe place. Uh, I hope you understand my English is not that perfect but I hope it's clear. Um, our history with Yemen actually started since 1980s, um, when there is uh, no hospitals, great hospitals, and there were, um, they are suffering from a lot of diseases like diarrhea, um, uh, infectious infectious diseases and then the government helped them in in uh, helping uh, like building hospitals and schools and in 1990s uh, there was giant earthquake in Yemen the government also um, fund the Yemen with money as helping them and food and we're also in by the I think it's near to the end of 1990s or in the middle of 1990s there was uh, WHO stated that a lot of children in Yemen suffer from polio and then my uh, country Saudi Arabia sent Saudi Red Crescent um, people having this vaccine, polio vaccine, to help these uh, children. And this is, has nothing maybe to do with this, but I wanted to say a lot. I'm from southern part of Saudi Arabia, the borderline with Yemen. I have two of my relatives died. Um, it's really uh, not pleasant. It was killed by Houthis. Uh, I, I don't think so. Saudi Arabia started killing Yemen first without they are first attacking us. And my aunt and uncles lives in Yemen. So two of my cousins killed by Houthi. There is civil uh, war inside the Yemen. So nobody mentioned that Saudi Arabia is protecting their nation. No, we have a lot of people killed, just to say the truth. Um, I, I, I hate the concept of killing. I'm not against or with what is Saudi Arabia is doing right now, but the concept of killing, I hate it so much as a nurse. I love to save people's life, and I wish that no more killing in our world and peace. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Divided loyalties. Okay, can we have another question and then we will go to the panel for some last words. Was there any other? Okay, so you'll be the, oh, you wanna go too, Steve will be last. Okay, so two more and then we'll have this. Okay, hello, thank you all. Um, uh, my name is Stuart Battle. I, uh, I'm a member of the LaRouche Political Action Committee. Um, this reminds me of 
the, cri the crisis that has been discussed, especially by Congressman Smith and by uh, Kate, I forget, on the end. Well, okay. <laughs> Remi reminds me of the, of the, of the, the religious warfare in Europe that was, went for 150 years, and it was nonstop killing of all sides um, for generation upon generation that was resolved in the, in the Treaty of Westphalia in the middle 1600s. For the reason, and I don't think this has been raised yet, which is what, I, what my question is, is that the Treaty of Westphalia took as its fundamental um, premise was that there had to be, uh, there had to be a, a, a taking into consideration of what was in the interest of the other. That it couldn't just be a killing of, of who killed my son or my father or my wife, but it had to be a consideration of, of what is in the interest of the other in order for there to be a peace that would be lasting. And so I'm afraid the United States cannot broker that kind of peace anymore. Um, I think that it would be hypocritical if we pretended we could. Um, and I think that a lot of the discussion about us being defenders of human rights is, is kind of silly in the case of the arguments that have been made here today, frankly. Um, what I do see, and what I wanted to pose or ask about, is that what I do see is that the, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative is kind of taking the, this part of the world by storm, whether we like it or not, and, and frankly, I, I, I do like it. I think the fact that there are hundreds of millions of people that have been brought out of poverty by the Chinese intention to develop, and that this clearly is, is something that a better United States could work with, a Middle Eastern countries, particularly Yemen, being something, being a country that could massively benefit, not just by stopping the bombing, but by moving in with real infrastructure and economic development. And, and so that's what I wanted to ask about in terms of what the world could look like with that kind of perspective. Thank you. All right. That, so, I can't speak for my fellow panelists. That's as much as I'm going to be able to do. Okay, so I guess that's the end of the questions. Is that what you're suggesting? No, no, not the end of the questions. We just want to answer the ones. Sure, go ahead. Then. Go, go ahead. Yeah, answer. Okay. Um, so on the question of um, peace-driven. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. We lost our entirely. <laughs> um, so just on the question about um, peace driven by self-determination for the Yemeni people, I cannot find you wherever you are in this room. Um, but hello. Yeah. Um, absolutely. That is exactly what should be happening. You know, I think that the most likely way to resolve the war is to first address the intervention and end the intervention. And then, and that requires a multilateral diplomatic effort, um, as well as pressure from the UK and the US in particular to get Saudi Arabia to the table and have those new negotiations really focused on Saudi Arabia's security concerns um, that were mentioned um, with uh, missiles being shot across the border. Um, because again, these, this border issue has been going on for decades at this point, and so really there needs to be some type of agreement that addresses those concerns in the long term um, that allows Saudi Arabia to end this intervention. Um, but then afterwards, the international community cannot forget about Yemen. Um, there needs to be a reinvigoration of this US-led peace process, but Yemenis need to be front and center. And it cannot just be the Yemenis who are holding the guns and part of the warring parties, it needs to be civil society, it needs to be women, it needs to be youth activists who are sidelined in the transitional process in 2011. Um, and kind of going to the second question, I agree that the U.S. cannot credibly broker a peace in Yemen while it continues to arm one side of the conflict. It's a contradictory role. The Yemeni people would not look at them as a legitimate actor. Um, so there does need to be a multilateral strategy here. Russia needs to be involved. Iran needs to be involved. Um, potentially the Chinese, though they're not yet there in Yemen. Um, so I absolutely agree with that. In terms of just the Chinese Belts and Roads initiatives, I think there's problems with the way that the money is invested and then has strings attached to it later on. Um, but at the same time, those are the types of initiatives to lift people out of poverty that have long-term effects for peace and stability. So I absolutely agree that the US should be trying to actually foment that type of change in the region rather than bringing down a military hammer. 
Okay. I also want to address the uh, peace within the many um, different groups that are fighting right now. I think f for once we need the government, the Yemeni government in Saudi Arabia is controlled by the Saudi. And they're not going to be able to make any decisions independent, independently. So once we have that resolved, where the Saudis agree that they need to be part of the negotiation, they cannot pretend that the Yemenis need to sit down together and then there is going to be a solution. The Saudis are determining what the a government in exile is doing and saying. So there are two prongs to that. One is the Saudi-Yemeni negotiation, and then the second one is the Yemeni-Yemeni negotiations. Yemeni have a very strong tradition of negotiating even the most difficult situations. And that w can, can be invoked, and they can sit down together and reach a, a resolution that you know, works for everyone. Actually, Bin Omar, who was the UN envoy to Yemen, had actually come out and said the Yemenis had reached a, um, a resolution. And they were going to form a unity government. And that was the night when the Saudis invited him to Riyadh and started the bombing. Uh, in terms of my dear friend from Saudi Arabia, uh, yes, I think there are a lot of issues uh, at, the, at the border. But uh, the reason I decided not to use Arabic um, resources because they are so biased. <laughs> because if it's a Saudi, uh, and, you know, outlet, they're going to present the Saudi side. If it's the Yemeni pro-Houthi, they're going to present the Yemeni pro-Houthi side. So I decided to use UN reports and U.S. media, because this is an issue. They, they are more um, unbiased compared to other reporting. Okay. Well, well building, building off of all three, three of the questions, being with the, the, the young woman from Saudi Arabia, um, or I guess one parent's Yemeni and one's Saudi, I mean, it, it does come down to the, the reason that the Saudis are in, engaged here is because they are afraid of Iranian influence. Um, and I think I agree with my fellow panelists that they're going about it in a way that is going to undermine their long-term interests um, by simply alienating people in, in the neighborhood through, through violence. Um, but that's it. It's a Sunni-Shia split, and they're worried that the Houthis will be too friendly with Iran, and they have this whole, you know, Iran wants to you know, take over and dominate uh, the Middle East, starting with their control in Syria, and obvious, you know, now what's going on in Iraq and Lebanon. Um, which sort of leads into what um, the young man was saying about Westphalia. And he's right. Um, and this sort of connects to the fact that part of the reason that the U.S. can't broker peace here is not so much as to you know, our legitimacy. It's not directly our fight. Uh, the people in that region have to decide um, that they want to stop fighting and move towards peace. And I think the analogy to what happened with the religious wars in Europe is very apt, uh, both in terms of people being, you know, just clinging to their side and their religious beliefs um, against the others, and then the personal aspect of it that was mentioned. You know, once you've had a relative or a friend killed in this war, you know, a lot of people don't want to make peace, they want to get even. And until you stop that, um, until you decide that the future is more important than the past, and gosh, the, the past just echoes throughout the Middle East and other parts of the world as well, but if you're trying to get even for past slights, this will never stop. But that said, I think there is a role for us to play to try to bring people together and get them to that point. And lastly, uh, on China, I do not disagree that if China wants to be actively involved in the world uh, to try to bring greater development, and look, China's got self-interest in it. They want to sell their stuff to these countries. Uh, they want these countries to become as loyal customers to them as so many of the countries post-World War II were to us. But if they're playing that role and helping to reduce poverty as the second largest economic power in the world, 
that's a good thing. And, and finally, I will observe that we have many criticisms and some have been voiced about the way China does that. Um, you know, they do it in many cases in some ways that aren't particularly helpful to the local population. They come in and sort of suck the resources out um, and don't leave much behind. But if you go back to post-World War II and U.S. involvement across the globe, and I think many in this audience are very knowledgeable we don't have the best record either. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, had an interest there, and you know, actually another class that I taught was about that, that region of the world and its conflict, and it has an enormous humanitarian crisis. crisis. And we are the ones um, who propped up a dictatorship in the DRC um, back in the day because and Mobutu um, was, he was anti-communist. And that's all we cared about. He literally destroyed not just the Congo, but about a dozen countries surrounding him in an endless cycle of war and corruption um, that that region has never recovered from. Um, that was our involvement. Um, so while we're looking at China and worrying about their involvement, I think we can all learn from past mistakes and do better in terms of bringing greater peace and prosperity to different parts of the world. And there's room for multiple players. Uh, and China certainly is going to be one of them. I think that was an excellent way to end the program. We're at six o'clock. I know there were more people lined up to speak, um, but we said we'd end at six, and I think people can come forward and chat for a bit. Um, don't forget the message of this program, which is that each of you has a role to play in this. Uh, repeat back to me the name of the congressional resolution. H Con Res eighty one, very good. But can I just don't forget it. Kate Gould, you have one last thing to one, say? One quick thing, because I just want to clarify. So H Con Res, anything that begins with an H, that's in the House. There's gonna be this new legislation in the Senate. We don't have a number for it yet, but you will find out the number if you sign up on our sign up sheet going around. <laughs> um, and you can also, you know, find our organizations on Facebook and Twitter and you can find us and talk to us afterwards and all that. Uh, but that that legislation is coming soon um, and that's a big opportunity to make a difference. All right, thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you so much.